Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, very brief housekeeping. I am getting ready to go to London to do an event with Richard Dawkins and Matt Dillahunty. Looking forward to that. And I have a separate live podcast tour coming up. And those tickets just went on sale to the general public. These will be live recordings of the podcast in Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, D.C., and Philadelphia. As you know, supporters of the podcast get early access to tickets, and that is seeming to matter more and more. I I offer that as a perk to supporters, as seems only decent. But I I just checked, and it really does seem like a perk. The, The good seats sell out very quickly, and In fact, San Francisco is 60% sold out already. So if you want to come to a live podcast with surprise guests, you might want to get on that. I know it looks like these events are still months out, but in my experience, the venues are filling up fairly quickly, and the best tickets are invariably going to supporters. Okay. Today I'm speaking with Mark Lilla. Mark is a professor at Columbia University and a prize-winning essayist for the New York Review of Books and many other publications. His books include The Shipwrecked Mind, The Stillborn God, The Reckless Mind, and his latest book, which is what we discuss, is The Once and Future Liberal. And Mark and I talk about essentially the, the nature and history of liberalism in the United States and how identity politics has changed it. We talk about the ways in which identity politics may or may not be legitimate. We talk about the role of class in American society, wealth inequality, and we disagree about a few things. We agree about others, but it was a very enjoyable conversation and one that many of us who care about the future of politics have been having more and more. So now, without further delay, I bring you Mark Lilla. I am here with Mark Lilla. Mark, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to be here. So uh, we have a mutual friend in Andrew Sullivan. I think that was our connection. And Andrew is someone who I have sparred with to our mutual amusement and benefit. And he's the great example for me of someone who you can disagree stridently with and still become friends. This is really the what I aspire to have all disagreements become, but it doesn't usually work out that way. Yeah, the two of you have been going at each other for quite a while, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So you've written this wonderful new book, and it, it's wonderful also in part because it's so short. It really is one of these books that you can pick up and finish, no matter what your bandwidth problems are. Uh, and the title is The Once and Future Liberal. And it's really this elegy for a real liberal politics that we seem to have lost. And in its place, we have this horror show of identity politics. So before we get into this, perhaps um, oh, perhaps you can just summarize your background as a writer and political scientist and journalist. How do you describe what you have done and, and focused on as a writer? Well, uh, the stuff that's relevant to this book, I think, uh, in my biography is I grew up in a place called Macomb County, Michigan, which is a blue collar county bordering on Detroit. Um, M&M grew up on 10 Mile Road. I grew up on 12 Mile Road. Mm. (laughs) So uh, Macomb County used to be, in the early 60s, the most democratic, lopsidedly democratic county in a suburban county in America. By 1972, George Wallace won the Michigan primary, and the county went for Nixon. And ever since, political scientists have been studying it, and uh, pollsters have been studying it as the home of Reagan Democrats. And uh, I saw this change happen in my life. I saw it happen with my neighbors. I saw it happen within my own family, extended family, not my close family. And I've been puzzling ever since then about why it is that uh, the party and liberalism more generally lost the affection and the um, 
enthusiasm of what used to be their base, their white working class base, and what might uh, bring us back on course. So I got a, just a, I started at Wayne State University, uh, commuting, putting myself through school, got a scholarship to Michigan and went off to the Kennedy School to study public policy. And when I was done, I was offered a job on the public interest by my professor, Daniel Bell. And uh, the public interest was known as uh, the first neoconservative magazine. But what neoconservative meant back in the 70s is that you were, as Irving Kristol liked to put it, a liberal who had been mugged by reality. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that uh, you were still a liberal, but you realized that uh, a lot of the solutions uh, that, uh, or rather programs that we thought would solve social problems uh, didn't do so well, and some of them were counterproductive. Uh, I realized that uh, no one was paying attention to economic growth and, uh, and also not paying attention to the white working class. So it was people, uh, and the working class more generally. And so it was uh, that the party had been sort of captured by the activist class. So people who had been involved with, uh, you know, the, uh, I forget what it was called, the Coalition for Democratic Majority. So Bill Clinton came out of that. Uh, Pat Moynihan was part of that. He was on our board. And so being a neoconservative meant being a kind of reform liberal, mm. while liberalism sort of took off in its own direction after, after McGovern. And so ever since I've watched these various, uh, you know, the, the, the lines between right and left and liberal and conservative move around, I don't feel I've moved that much. I moved some, but uh, but essentially, I'm still the kind of prima govern liberal that I was back then. And so, you know, I've been writing, um, I've been writing uh, in the New York Review of books about American politics, the American right, and then in my more scholarly work, I've been writing about uh, attacks, modern attacks on the Enlightenment. Well, let's define a few terms here that, because of these key words that you use in the book. So let's start with liberal. How, how do you define liberal? What, what does it mean? And, and perhaps you could disentangle it from, if it can be disentangled, from the word left. Well, uh, I think we have to talk about those two terms in the American context. The word liberal means something else in England. It means something very different on the continent, uh, where it essentially means just uh, radical free market views. American liberalism was always, um, I think, uh, founded on or, or developed around two fundamental principles from the progressives through the New Deal. And the first was social solidarity, that we stuck together, that uh, the Hoover Republicans were happy to let people uh, fall off by the side of the road. And the other is that there should be equal protection under the law. And so those two principles were the principles that liberals professed. They didn't always live up to those principles uh, when it came to practice. Uh, and so, uh, and then I think what was added on to that was uh, liberal anti-communism and no illusions about uh, Marxism and especially uh, communism as both in theory and in practice. And so there was a kind of liberal anti-communist consensus, uh, certainly, that um, continued from the New Deal down into the 1980s. And the left, I suppose you could say, includes some of those liberals, but there are people on the left who, while they accept some of those, those two principles of solidarity and equal protection, uh, have always had a soft spot, uh, if not for communism, then for Marxism, for movement politics, uh, for uh, radical, uh, radical movements uh, uh, seeking some sort of imaginary change, in, in my view. And so, you know, on the left, I would say there were the sober people who were the liberals and then everyone else. And what about the term progressive? Well, the word progressive, you know, originally uh, was you know, sort of the foundation of liberalism, you know, but progressivism uh, was also very patriotic. It's very interesting now to return to the writings of Teddy Roosevelt and to read his attacks on monopoly and his fight for protecting American workers, which was wrapped up with a kind of optimism about the country and the experiment that it is. 
and uh, a defense of America as a nation and as one nation without denying the, uh, you know, the kind of social diversity that we have. He believed in a kind of unifying citizenship. And uh, people who call themselves progressive, have, you know, have held on to the economic message, but they've lost that sense of the nation. And that's what I'm trying to bring back in in my book. Yeah, you describe a time when liberals could salute the flag without embarrassment. And I must say that is a time before my time, or certainly before any time I can remember. Liberalism, at least in my experience, has always been associated with it with a kind of cynical distance from anything that could be called patriotism without any kind of self-consciousness. And I'm wondering when that happened. I mean, is this what Watergate in Vietnam did to liberalism? Well, I think it begins with uh, the civil rights movement and the recognition that uh, Democrats uh, in particular had allowed uh, Jim Crow to continue and flourish in the South. And that seemed to be a violation of what the country stood for and what liberalism seemed to stand for. And then, of course, Watergate, I think, was less important than Vietnam, uh, which really broke the contract between uh, the American government and uh, the American people. You know, I saw this quite intimately where I grew up. Uh, where I grew up, a lot of kids uh, served in Vietnam. And I had a paper route, and in the afternoons, I'd drive by at dusk, and I would see these stars in the window. Now, do you know what a star in the window used to be? Uh, no. Well, it used to be that if you had a child in the military, that uh, the, uh, the army or whatever the service was would send you a little flag with a star on it. And what people would do, they'd hang them in the window with a kind of Christmas light around it so you could see that they had someone there. And the flags came in two colors. There was one color if your child was alive, and there was another one if he or she had died there. And so you could just drive by you know, I drove by on my bike and I would just see all these lights and the two colors and know when it was that someone lost somebody. And I was an altar boy. I served at funerals of families that lost their sons. And, and you know, uh, those people felt on the one hand betrayed by the government because it was clear that their sons were dying to no purpose, but they had even deeper anger at the elite class of journalists and writers and activists and kids on campus who were spitting on the flag that they had just used to drape the coffins of their sons. And I saw that happen before my eyes. And so it both disaffected these people from other liberals and also from the government itself and made them cut them loose in a way for whoever came along. And Nixon came along promising to end the war. Reagan came along promising to make everything better and on and on. And now Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about anger at the elites eventually, because that is at the center of so much of what's going on in our politics now, on really on both the left and the right. Before we press on, what is identity politics? Well, uh, I, I think the meaning of identity politics has changed. So I, I need to distinguish the kind of identity politics that began in the 50s and what we're living with now. You know, with the civil rights movement, you had a movement that was focused on one identity group, and then you had the women's movement that did the same, and the early gay rights movement. And those identity movements, in a sense, weren't about identity. They were about groups, but they weren't about so much about the inner experience of an identity. Rather, they were about making America fulfill its promise to make everyone an equal citizen. And so those movements were really about enfranchisement, that you say we're citizens and we're not full citizens. And so that is very consistent, to my mind, with the older liberal tradition. Uh, but then what happened uh, in the 80s and on is that people who were wrapped up in in the politics of these movements, became very self-referential. And uh, for them, an identity uh, was not something that bound people together and to the country, 
but rather it became a kind of way of reflecting on difference. And a lot of social movements broke apart on the basis of identity resentments. And so the new left broke apart uh, for all kinds of reasons, but one of them is that uh, African Americans complained that they weren't part of the leadership, which is true. Women complained that they weren't part of the leadership, which was true. Uh, lesbians complained that feminists uh, were normalizing heterosexuality, which was also true. And so the, the united front of the left broke down over these identity issues. And then what happened is that there was a retreat to the universities. And so people on the left really abandoned electoral politics in these groups and instead developed this idea that all social change happens through social movements that are tied to identity. And you end up with gender theory, you end up with race theory, you end up with feminist theory, and you end up now with maybe three generations of young people, liberal elites, who've been brought up in the university to think about politics in terms of group and their own individual identities, rather than of the common good and uh, a message that might bind us together as a nation. Yeah, you have a nice passage here on what happened to the New Left, and I'm quoting you. The New Left was torn apart by all the intellectual and personal dynamics that plague every left plus a new one, identity. Racial divisions were quick to develop. Blacks complained that most leaders were white, which was true. Feminists complained that most all were men, which was also true. Soon black women were complaining about, both about the sexism of radical black men and the implicit racism of white feminists, who themselves were being criticized by lesbians for presuming the naturalness of the heterosexual family. What all these groups wanted from politics was more than social justice and an end to the war though they did want that. They also wanted there to be no space between what they felt inside and what they did out in the world. They wanted to feel at one with the political movements that mirrored how they understood and defined themselves as individuals. And I love that. I mean, that picture of fragmentation seems exactly what has happened. And you have this, you know, what has been described as the, the oppression Olympics, where there's a an economy of, of victimhood where certain identities trump others. And if you are a, a black lesbian, uh, you know, you're somewhere near the, the apex of, of grievance. Uh, and therefore, more or less anything you say is undeniable by someone who doesn't share your identity. If you're a black, lesbian, Muslim, well, then better yet. So, so I, I, I've been paying a little attention to the reception of your, that your book has gotten. And uh, so I, I noticed, for instance, the review in the New York Times, which had to be annoying to you. It was annoying to me. I hadn't even read your book, and it was obvious that that review was silly and unfair. And then I also saw the interview you did with David Remnick in The New Yorker, and he seemed, again, desperate to shore up some concept of identity politics. What has been your experience thus far in making your case? post-publication, and why do you think people are not readily seeing what is wrong with identity politics, both politically as a, as a matter of just political pragmatics, but also intellectually and morally? Well, I think one of the reasons, uh, well, there are two reasons, I think. One of the reasons is that uh, identity politics has really become an evangelical project um, and <clears throat> or it has all the all the markings of American revivalist religion you know the fact that we use the word woke uh, which comes from you know which comes from conversion the you know the, the the great awakenings in this country and especially over the past three four years for some reason we've gotten into a panic about a lot of these issues that are real issues but they've been around for a long time and suddenly uh, there's developed a hypersensitivity about certain things. And there are reasons for that. You know, uh, what's happened with African Americans and the police and various other things, Charlottesville, you know, th there, there are reasons uh, for that. But it's also become dogmatic in the sense that it's not that people want you to agree with them or even just to work with you. 
They want you to believe, they want you to accept their version of American history, their critique of American society, uh, their particular critique of the police. And while you may agree with some of those things, uh, what you look for in politics is kind of common ground, what you can agree on, like mis police mistreatment of African-American motorists, for example, and you can work on that together. So, uh, you know, they become people who won't take yes for an answer, I think, often. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I, I have felt in the reaction to the book that I put my finger on a real nerve or a sore spot. And that is that I keep saying in interviews, as I say in the book, that protecting minority groups is what we do as liberals. That's what we're about. You cannot protect anyone if you don't hold institutional power. Institutional power in this country is not just held in the presidency, it's held in the courts, Congress, and especially at the state and local level. If you are not competitive at the state and local level or the congressional level, you cannot protect anybody. Now, the only way to be successful at those levels is to have a message that reaches beyond your identity group. Therefore, if you want to actually protect um, African Americans, gays and lesbians just walking down the street holding hands, women who are being paid less than men, you need to hold power. And you have, to ch you have to find a new message, not one based on yourself and your feelings and your identity, but a message about certain principles that, will, that you hold and that inform your, your political commitments, but that other people can also hold. And so these big themes of solidarity and equal protection, I think, at, just as principles most Americans uh, hold to, if you just ask them, but then once you get down to cases, then you're going to have disagreements and you can persuade people. But if you say to someone, you must understand me, but you cannot understand me because of who you are, uh, you completely uh, hermetically sealed yourself and you're unable to persuade anyone else. And so your politics become expressive and you fall in love with noble defeats. You you become a bully too. I mean, that is the what is left for you to do by way of persuasion, because reason has failed. There is to just bully people with, in this case, the threat of being called a racist. Uh, it's interesting what what you just said strikes me as a fairly complete recapitulation of what I recall Hillary Clinton saying when confronted by some Black Lives Matter people at, at one of her events. Yeah, yeah, I, I mentioned it briefly in, in the book. And, you know, she, I, I forget if it was at that time or not, but, but they were just, they weren't letting her speak. Uh, you know, they had adopted these Mau Mau uh, tactics of breaking into meetings, not letting people speak. And I, I forget if it was then or another time when Hillary Clinton pointed out that Martin Luther King would not have achieved his goals were it not for the practical politician, LBJ, who was willing to cut deals, cut deals with Dixiecrats, and to make the you know, civil rights legislation happen, the Great Society programs. Movements alone cannot achieve anything. And institutional politics can always trump what movements have achieved. I mean, look what's happening at the state and local government in this country. The Democratic Party and feminist groups fought for a constitutional uh, right for a woman to get an abortion. That was achieved. But in large parts of this country, a woman de facto cannot get an abortion. That is not because we haven't marched enough. It isn't because we haven't uh, had enough court cases. It's because Democrats and liberals do not hold power in, at the state and local level where, where, in subtle and not so subtle ways, it's become impossible for people to run clinics where a woman can get an abortion. And they also feel under a threat of violence. And the only way to change that, the only way to make that right actual, is to go out to the South and the Southwest and find a way to convince those people to come over to your side. There's no other way.
you got to get out of your bubble. You got to get out from behind your laptop and you've got to go and meet people and talk to them just to reach your ends, not because you need to genuflect to the white working class or Joe Sixpack as if he's some sort of special figure to achieve what you want to achieve. You've got to get out there. Now, but now you have argued that, I think you say this in your book, perhaps this was just in an interview, but I believe you've argued that there's an asymmetry here between the right and the left. There's an, there's an identity politics of the right as well, but where identity politics is a losing strategy for liberals, it isn't necessarily a losing strategy on the right. That's right. I mean, you know, uh, it, it's hard to know what to say about this subject at this moment, because 10 years ago, when researchers would ask white people in surveys, how, how important is your white identity? and you feel whites are being discriminated against, you get maybe 5%. Now the figures are up over 25%. And why is that? Well, it's not that people have always felt that way. Rather, you know, we have a right-wing uh, media, uh, almost monopoly on news in, in parts of this country that have been able to play this up. And they've been able to play it up uh, in part because we on the liberal side keep talking about identity. That's not to say that identity politics creates racism. It is to say that uh, it can make it more salient at different moments. And, uh, you know, the rise of this white consciousness, you know, it's, it's tied to all sorts of things, including social changes that have happened in the country economic changes, you know, the, rising import, the, the rise of a black middle class, um, the fact that, you know, women are in the workplace, and, uh, the, and, and also the growth of a non-working white male population. Uh, but uh, so, you know, we're in a funny moment right now. But in this moment, at least, it's certainly clear, and Steve Bannon said this himself, that the more we talk about difference and engage in sort of campus, uh, campus opera buffa, uh, the more we help recruit people to the other side to say we have an identity too. You know, uh, Breitbart, Breitbart ran an article about my book saying we've been saying this stuff for years and it's been working for us. And Steve Bannon said that in his famous interview with Bob Kuttner that got him fired. He said, keep talking about that issue. It's working for me, man. Just keep talking about them. Yeah. And on one level, it's just, if you're going to practice identity politics, you shouldn't be surprised when white people eventually practice identity politics of their own. But is it a consequence of the fact that whites are still a majority in the country, that, that it's, it doesn't, the identity aspect of it doesn't prove to be a liability in the same way? I mean, what, actually, to give you just a little more material here, I wanted to read another passage, which points up, again, it's, I don't know if this is the same asymmetry, but it, it certainly is an asymmetry. Well, you talk about how the, the, the web pages of the two parties differ, and you talk about, you know, on the Republican site at the time you wrote this, there was a, essentially a white paper titled Principles for American Renewal, and just it was just a statement of, of positions of the party and just a vision for, you know, where the party wanted to take the country. And then you said on the Democratic website, there was no such document, uh, now I'm quoting you, there's no such document to be found on the Democrats' homepage. Instead, when you scroll to the bottom of it, you find a list of links titled People. And each link takes you to a page tailored to appeal to a distinct group and identity. Women, Hispanics, quote, ethnic Americans, the LGBT community, Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. There are 17 such groups and 17 separate messages. You might think that by some mistake you've landed on the website for the Lebanese government, not a party with a vision for America's future. I mean, I don't know if that's the same geometry of, of weakness there, but you can see how that kind of fragmentation, where, that, like, like where, where we means nothing but diverse groups, each of which 
is solely empowered to attest to its own grievances by virtue of its identity, that's not a moral or a political foundation from which to argue in ways that will attract people from outside your group to form a common cause with you. Yeah. uh, One thing I've learned in talking about the book is that um, I should have emphasized one thing more that I say, but I I needed to put it front and center. And that is that you cannot understand any social problem in America without talking about identity. You can't understand poverty. You cannot understand unemployment. You can't understand incarceration policy. If you don't address how these policies affect many of these different groups. That's absolutely right. And we're more aware of that now, and that's a good thing. But when it comes to addressing those problems and building a common vision for the country that will appeal to people who aren't members of those groups, that's the time to employ a different kind of rhetoric. And so often the response I'm getting from people is, but how can we not talk about identity because identity is important in all these ways? That's true. So when you analyze a problem, you you know what your commitments are once you understand the role of identity in this country. But in order to follow through and achieve a result out there and not simply express yourself and make yourself heard, politics is not a speech act. Politics requires a common effort and persuasion, not self-expression. And uh, so it it requires a kind of double-mindedness, I would say now, about identity, recognizing it to understand the country, speaking in a different way in order to try to do something about it. I guess I'm going to sound more skeptical of identity than than you do, at least in this moment. I mean, again, I, I hear you arguing that it's politically imprudent to emphasize identity as a as a matter of moving forward, but I just actually think that for most of the problems, and certainly for every problem where identity isn't actually the relevant variable, it represents a moral and intellectual error to be speaking in terms of identity. So I'm thinking of what the writer and philosopher Rebecca Goldstein recently said. She said, to the extent that we're rational, we share the same identity. That really gets at the heart of what my concern is with identity politics. It's, just, it's that, I mean, that is what it is to be rational. It, 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 rationality is how we fuse our cognitive horizons with strangers who are capable of reasoning in the same way based on the same evidence. And so by that measure, identity politics is a failure of rationality. And so I meant to give you a, an example that will make this clear, if you and I we're going to talk about what's wrong with Black Lives Matter right now as a movement. You know, we as two white guys talking about this, we are guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, to be attacked as racists by people in that movement just for speaking critically about it, no, no, no matter how legitimate our criticism is. And, th- and these charges of racism will come without any evidence to substantiate them, apart from the fact that we spoke critically about the movement, and without any apparent awareness of a burden to rebut the substantive points we actually made about the movement. So, I mean, this, is, this gets at the heart, again, of what I think is so toxic about identity politics, is that, I mean, if there are things that are wrong with Black Lives Matter, the color of a person's skin is totally irrelevant when pointing these things out. And the core of Black Lives Matter seems to be not understanding that fact. And obviously, I'm not saying that a person's life experience doesn't reveal certain problems to him or, or conceal others from him. And, and, and this is a point you make in the book, and this is a point I've made on this podcast. A white guy like me or you can't claim to know what it's like to be a black man driving a car and being pulled over by the cops and searched without due cause. If it's not an experience we've had, there's something we're missing there. But I would argue we're not missing the important piece when actually talking about injustice in our society. And if you're, if you're going to argue, I'm not saying you, but if one is going to argue that 
the core problems of justice and fairness and equality can't be argued for in a way that transcends race. It just strikes me as manifestly untrue and also totally counterproductive for the people who need those arguments most right now. Well, here we're going to have an interesting disagreement, actually. Cool. So uh, this will be fun. Uh, to begin with, I think it's true that a lot of our problems uh, that we face right now have nothing to do with identity. I mean, the problem of monopoly in this country, I failed to see, or dealing with North Korea or environmental problems, I failed to see the identity angle to all of those. There are all sorts of issues that we, that we can talk about. But it's true that Americans right now are overly identity conscious, I would say, and, and have an idea an idea of, thick, of sociological categories. You know, I find out which box you go in and that's your identity. And so I know what you're going to say and what you believe. That's all right. But on the other hand, it's important to identify with something uh, in order to, mo to motivate action and to build solidarity. I do not jump into the water to save my drowning mother rather than someone else who's there drowning because I have a rational argument. I do it because I have a feeling. And those feelings, we might want to criticize afterwards, but we know that if, there, if you, it gives you a pre-commitment to at least somebody, right? And so it makes perfect sense to me that let's say, a college-educated, middle-class African-American uh, who may no longer face the discrimination of his parents and grandparents, to feel a sense of solidarity with the group that will make him want to actually act and not simply make arguments in the marketplace. You know, what, what gives our lives some thickness is a little bit of partisanship. I mean, we're partisan. I'm a partisan of, of, of my family over your family. If push came to shove, it doesn't mean we're going to be the Hatfields and the McCoys. I have a pre-commitment to my country, and we want to rely on that as well. You know, and, and so this picture of, you know, that the, there is no direct route from the rational mind to human action that does not pass through something emotional. Right. And, uh, you know, Plato understood this. I mean, all these you know, earlier myths of what we are inside psychologically, that we have three parts. We have a rational part. We have an appetitive part that just desires things. And then we have this thing in the middle, which is emotional. It gets attached to things. It, can, it is not rational, but it can be trained by reason. And so, you know, I think it, you know, would be a terrible thing if we lived in a world without that identification and if we were just elementary particles floating out there. Because why sacrifice? You know, I got a, I got a lesson in that when I went in the 1980s. I spent some time in Poland during the Solidarity Years, and I had ceased being a Catholic long ago. And but I saw the power of Catholicism to make people stick together and fight communism. So they associated the religion with the fate of the nation. Now, that's now leading to all sorts of problems in Poland because it's taking this anti-liberal turn. But it's also the case that people would not have resisted without that sense that some thing, some identity thing bound them together. That's a move, I think, that is not necessarily warranted because you're not, you're not sure what the counterfactual situation would be. And I, I mean, I would argue that, yes, it's absolutely clear that tribalism of all kinds is energizing and religious tribalism is especially so. But the idea that you can't find a non-sectarian source of energy in the face of evil, right, or in the face of dysfunction or the, in the face of injustice, I just don't think that's true. You know, if there's a, a hurricane bearing down on your city and you have to start filling sandbags, the hurricane is motivating enough. And the, the idea that you're a Christian filling sandbags is, I think, in, in the best case, irrelevant. I'll grant you that descriptively, identity 
has been an enormous source of energy, you know, moral and otherwise for people. But it, it then does take the turn that you just described in Poland, whereas it becomes a basis of, you know, its own form of intolerance and, and anti-liberalism. And I, I mean, so I, just to roll back to what you said initially on this topic, if I have to pick a side, I'm on the side of someone who's making sense, right? And the moment a person of my religion or my skin color or my political party stops making sense, I'm on the side of the person of whatever skin color or whatever religion or whatever political party who points that out because error is the problem. You know, dishonesty is the problem. Confirmation bias is the problem. Delusion is the problem. And I just see pegging anything of real substance to identity is a kind of anchor to delusion or it's a kind of machinery for producing delusion or at least self-deception in the future, in the, in the most benign case. And I, and I think the analogy you drew to saving your drowning mother as opposed to my drowning mother, I mean, that's, th those are the kinds of examples that, that while understandable, I mean, you, you would think there's something wrong with you if you were, as someone like the Dalai Lama professes to be, indifferent to who you save because all beings are, are equally ends in themselves. There's, there's something about that ethics that we can't totally embrace and feel good about ourselves, at least most of us. But those are precisely the cases of bias that can't be mapped on to society at large, and we constantly correct for them with our institutions and our laws, and we feel, not only do we feel good about doing that, we see that's the only way to go. So, I mean, the example I, I've given on this topic before, when I've spoken about the, the ethics here, is that obviously I'm partial to my child uh, and most concerned about my child's health. And, you know, there's lots of sick children in the world who I don't spend much time thinking about, but the moment my child gets sick, it consumes my day. So when I show up at the hospital with my child uh, and something's really wrong, I want to be seen as quickly as possible. But I don't actually want a hospital that is unfair. I want some process of triage going on in a hospital that I know will occasionally work to my disadvantage and, the, and the, the, the disadvantage of my child. But I just know that given everyone's competing interests and given the fact that somebody richer than me is going to show up at the hospital sometime when I'm there. A fair system is the only system that is, in fact, ethical. And I think that, that gets us out of identity the moment you have to map it on to society at large. Well, it seems to me you're leaving out, really, human imperfection and the imperfection of institutions. You know, if you're... Most hospitals, it's not a question of them having their ideas wrong about who should be treated. It's that they don't have enough resources. They don't have enough time. And if you're in an emergency room, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, in emergency rooms uh, with uh, family members that I've had to defend. You'd better be an advocate, right? You, oh, mean, yeah. Because yeah. You, you're in a non, you might say, non-optimal ethical situation, and all of life is non-optimal. And so... But except, it's, I mean, it's, let's just focus on that a little bit more, because so if I'm in the, mer in the emergency room with my daughter who's been injured, let's say she's got a broken arm or what I think is a broken arm, and I see the circumstance exactly as you describe, which is one of, of limitation and imperfection and therefore triage. And I'm, you know, obviously incredibly impatient to get my daughter seen. She's extremely uncomfortable. I'm advocating for her at the desk. And the nurse or doctor looks at me and says, We'll see her exactly as soon as we can. This patient over here is before you, and this patient is, is you know, going into cardiac arrest, right? That is an argument. The answer to that from me, if I'm an ethical, sane human being, isn't, fuck you, my daughter is the most important child on earth. But what if there are, but, but what if there are two children, they can only have one child. In terms of triage, there's no difference between the two of them. You're not going to advocate for your child? If you push me in truly into extremis, and these are both just, we truly have a, an emergency on our hands and one child is essentially going to die, well, then I can't really attest to how sane I will be. But I'll tell you who I think I should be in those moments is, 
someone who doesn't lose his awareness of the fact that other people are just as important to themselves and their children are just as important to them as I am to myself and my child is to me, and that there is a stepping out of oneself. There is a kind of view from nowhere that is a norm that is, again, something that we lose sight of. But when we're making laws and building institutions and designing our society, that's precisely what we try to, to hold on to. I mean, that, we, there is a, a kind of sure. a Rawlsian veil of ignorance here that is so incredibly useful because it is clarifying of all of the, of the kind of fragmentation you are describing here what, of mere identity and mere, this is my team and it's us against the world. Sure. But, uh, you know, uh, the problem with all those, I agree with you about ideally about our institutions. The problem with all those principles is that uh, they don't always motivate action, which is what we want. We don't want people to have their ethics right. We want them to do actually do the right thing. And that requires appealing to something that makes you listen to reason, right? And that's an emotion. I think you're selling people short there. because So when I look at my life, like everything, I mean, I'm not the most political person. I've sort of been dragged into politics as a result of how awful our politics have become. But when I look at you know, the hours I have spent railing against Trump and, you know, or take another topic that is motivating to me, the, the hours and the months and now years I've spent worrying about, writing about, speaking about the problem of jihadism, right? None of that is based on my identity. I mean, I'm certainly not saying anything I'm saying because I'm a Democrat or have been a Democrat or because I'm a Jew or because I, I mean, or because I'm white. I mean, none of that. There are people who would say, oh, no, actually, your criticism of Islam has everything to do with the fact that you're a Jew or that you're, you're white. But it actually doesn't. And I, I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with people who are, you know, former Muslims from Pakistan who have the same arguments and the same concerns. In fact, their concerns are even heightened. We can be motivated by reasons that have nothing to do well, with, an, course, with the not, accident not, of birth. I'm not denying that. Maybe we're talking past each other. I'm getting the impression that you want uh, a world bled of these identity uh, commitments. L l let me put it in a way that brings it back in relation to the book. And that is, um, one of the things that changes when you shift from identity politics version one, which is about um, making claims of a group in order to be incorporated into the nation, and model two, which is about your own personal identity, which is very fluid, which you kind of construct yourself like a Facebook page. And so your only attachments are to whatever groups you feel you're identifying with. That's a sign of, of kind of atomization of our society and a kind of radical libertarianism that is actually depoliticizing. Because the next step from that is to say, why should I care about other people in this group at all? I'm just myself. It, do, it doesn't motivate you to get out there. And I would imagine that one reason you got motivated about radical Islam is because this country got attacked. And I imagine that uh, the, the, the Muslims that you talk to are sympathetic to your point of view about radical Islam, are worried about their countries and their faith, right? These are emotional attachments we have, and the more atomized we become, uh, whether it goes from the nation to a group to me as an individual and my special little identity uh, within, the less we, we get together uh, to do something. And so, you know, at the end of the second chapter of the book, I say there's an odd overlap between Reaganite individualism uh, that said, you know, it's everyone for himself in the market and a kind of identity individualism that says, I, I construct my own identity. I have no pre-attachments to any group or certainly not to my country. So that identity politics becomes a kind of Reaganism for lefties. I think that's right. Well, let's bring in another variable here that we haven't spoken about. And you mention in your book fairly briefly, and it and I think you, you do say that it doesn't actually play the role one would expect it would play, and that's the, the variable of class. Why isn't class 
subsuming most of what we're talking about here. I mean, why, why, I, would, I would think, just naively, that class would trump most identities, which is to say that a truly wealthy black person or Muslim or LGBT person would perhaps on many of these questions have more in common with a truly wealthy person of a different identity than he or she would with someone who's classically in their in-group uh, who happens to be poor or, or really disadvantaged in that way. So talk a little bit about class and why you know, we haven't just been talking about class for the last hour. Yeah, no, that's the right question. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of things need to be said. One is that you're absolutely right. I think that non-college educated people, I mean, just a black guy and uh, a white guy who are working on a loading dock, what are they talking about all the time? They're talking about their wages. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about the schools. That's what they talk about. They don't talk about their differences. I got countless emails from people saying exactly that uh, after I wrote the article that became this book a year ago. You know, uh, a guy who had been in the military who uh, said, now I work in a military contractor. I've got a black woman who's my boss. She's smarter than any of us. I work with a diverse group of people. Uh, we belong to the same bowling team. And after we bowl, we go out and we talk about uh, economic problems and worrying about our kids in this world and whether they're going to get ahead. So if we actually talk more about those things, I think we would have a better chance of pulling people together. So why don't we? Which is your question. I think part of it is we've become a less mobile country uh, economically. I mean, uh, on indexes of economic mobility, the U United States after World War II ranked very, very high compared to Europe and Asia. Now we're, we're getting down to average or below. And so people who go into, uh, young people go into college today are uh, far more likely to have had professional educated parents and even grandparents. And they've never really experienced other people's lives and, and, and seen how important economic matters are. There are two things they don't get. They don't get how important religion is to people and they don't understand how much class matters out there. And so instead, they're taught to focus on identity as the big difference in life uh, and, and in American society when it isn't at all. And so Marxism fell out of favor for all sorts of reasons having to do with Marxism, but also, I think, with the increasing libertarianism and individualism of our society. And so, you know, uh, class solidarity was the product on the left, was a product of both a common experience, but also a common set of ideas that made sense or seemed to make sense of that idea. And now, uh, you know, liberals who, who matter in the talking classes, whether it's people who are in universities or in the press or in publishing houses or in law firms or in Washington, never experience, uh, or, or rather don't experience class differences and haven't experienced a, a, a sort of a upper mobility to the degree that an earlier generation of Americans did. Yeah, yeah. This part of the conversation is reminding me of the conversation I had with Charles Murray. And I'm sure you're familiar with his thesis of just how... No, I, I, li I listened to that podcast. Yeah, it was very interesting. The, my recognition of what a bubble I live in was made salient to me when I thought about the fact that Christopher Hitchens was the last person I knew on earth who smoked cigarettes. And, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so I, mean, I really can't say that with a straight face. That's where I am with respect to that variable. And that, as you know, segregates with so many other things. It seems to me that it's not only liberal elites or the, the chattering classes who are out of touch with the importance of class, it's also the underclass that's out of touch with the importance of class in some way. And I, th I see this in the fact that Trump managed to get elected. I mean, how is it that people who, for the most part, you know, aren't especially well-educated or well-off saw 
this boy king in his gilded palace and recognized in him somebody who was just like them and, and a champion of their interests. Yeah, well, that's one of the oldest questions in, you know, understanding America, right? Uh, Wende Zombach back in the 20s wrote a book called Why Is There No Socialism in America? Uh, because you had this working class and they didn't seem to be aware of it. And so socialists and Marxists for years tried to raise class consciousness and they had some success. But part of the problem is that the, the rhetoric of class that comes from Europe doesn't match onto American experience in the same way. You know, this is a country with bourgeois aspirations, uh, even in the, in, in the working classes. Uh, and you also have an elite that's, that up until recently was not a hereditary uh, elite, which is what Charles talks about in his book, but is becoming increasingly so. And so Charles points out in the book that it used to, that, you know, it used to be that American presidents sort of ate and drank alcohol the way most Americans did. They had canned peas and uh, they had a little alcohol, no wine with dinner, and they watched uh, a Western uh, at night on TV or at the movies. And our society is, you know, broken up, uh, you know, where there's a class and a social divide there uh, that's big. But I don't think one needs to talk about class as class so much to talk about privilege. You know, Americans don't like certain privileges and they interpret them in a funny way, you know? So here is Trump, who is what he is, fabulously wealthy. And as people keep saying, he's a poor man's idea of a, a rich man. He passes. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton push all the wrong buttons. Right, even though they care more about and have thought more concretely about uh, working people than uh, Donald Trump ever has, it has to do with the way they dress, the way they talk, the fact that one's African American, the the other is a woman. But you know, they're not in the comfort zone. You know, it's a very interesting. I, I lived in France for a number of years, and it was very striking to me that every time a, a male French politician uh, goes out to give a speech. He puts on his jacket and he tightens his tie and goes out and gives it no matter where he is. When an American male politician goes out, he takes off his jacket, he loosens his tie and he rolls up his sleeves because we have to give a sense here that we're regular people, right? So, you know, the, the, the way in which class works and the symbols work, the sort of democratic norms, the way that we uh, sort of uh, circumvent those norms and develop classes. It's, it's just a very complicated question. But if we talk about privilege, that there's a privileged class that's screwing you, which Bernie talked about, then that will have some resonance. Yeah, I guess there's another aspect to it, I, I think, which is aspirational. Where you, and this is, to some degree, uniquely American, where no matter what class someone is or, or, or how much how far to the wrong end of the tail of the bell curve they are economically, there's this sense that their lottery ticket might always come in, right? And so I, I, I was given a glimpse of this when I, I once wrote, I think it was in 2010, I wrote a couple of articles about, you know, just worrying about wealth inequality. And I got an immense amount of hate mail from people who clearly were not billionaires or you know, they're not people who, I mean, basically I had, you know, as I said, at some point this is, there's a certain level of wealth inequality that is clearly non-functional, you know, for our society. I mean, we're not, we, we do not want to live in a world where there are trillionaires just living in compounds ringed with razor wire and then everyone else is, you know, they've got people starving on the sidewalk outside their, their walls. So if you grant that at some point, you have to want to redistribute some of this wealth. I mean, the, 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 the billionaires need customers, right? And they need educated customers. And, they, and, and so even if it's it, just self-interest alone, if you're someone like, uh, you know, Steve Ballmer, I think who I, I was talking about at Microsoft, who had just put down at least a million dollars to fight, you know, having any income tax at all in Washington, I said, you know, at some point you have to recognize that you as a fantastically rich person, 
benefit from being surrounded by happy, productive, creative people who are not immiserated by need at every moment. Even for only selfish reasons, you should want a reduction of the most extreme wealth inequality. And for making that argument, I just heard from people who were outraged. I mean, it was, it's like a, this was a kind of taboo that I had articulated. That, and these were people who clearly thought on some level that they were going to be the next billionaires, or I mean, I'm sure they would not frame it that way. But I can imagine there are people who look at Trump in a kind of aspirational way, which is, you know, at some point, my life may take that turn toward the gilded palace. And therefore, I want to live in a system where you get to keep all your winnings without any self-consciousness, and you don't redistribute anything to my shiftless neighbor. Yeah, well, we've always had trouble with the language of, re of redistribution, which is why I think we should never use the word uh, politically. Um, it's one thing to talk about disadvantage, not being given a chance. Americans vibrate to that. Uh, but when it comes to actually moving money from person A to person B, they, you know, they feel that's a violation of something deep in what America is supposed to be. So it's very hard to develop a rhetoric and a message that uh, gets people uh, together in order to win elections and to pass legislation without tripping along all of, all of those wires. Though I have to say, you know, one thing that Donald Trump did, even though he is a billionaire, is that he, he attacked other billionaires and he attacked Wall Street, that's for sure, before bringing it into the cabinet. Uh, and he helped to bury, I think, a certain, the, the, uh, the Reagan party, the Reagan Republican Party, because he said it's not acceptable that our workers live like this. Now, no Republican had said that since 1980. I mean, workers were left to fend for themselves. Uh, and we were supposed to be against unions, right? That citizens are just roadkill. Uh, they're the tail of the distribution. Life is tough. Or they would say, don't worry about it. Tax cuts will solve everything. Well, there's not a single person in America left who believes that tax cuts will solve anything. That tax cuts Except, will is, not. Is that even true? Like, I, I remember at the time, I mean, this again, a few years old, but I remember. The polling that was done on this, where the percentage of of Americans who wanted to get rid of the estate tax, right, was I mean, it was, it was some enormous percentage of people polled thought that the estate tax was an absolute outrage. But the percentage of of Americans who are would ever conceivably have to pay an estate tax is is minuscule. I, I don't have the numbers at hand, but I mean, there is that kind of mismatch. I don't know if that's changed, but. That seems to be part of the the American political psychology. Yeah, what they worry about, you know, is something quite concrete for them, which is I was finally able to buy this house, thanks also to the government that gave me a tax deduction on the mortgage. And I just want to pass my house on to my kids. You know, that's pretty much their biggest asset, right? And so somehow targeting bigger estates and letting these people know that uh, we're not targeting you is, is, is a is a difficult thing to do, though it is true, you know, and Bernie would point this out on, on the stump that when you mention particular policies, like, do you think that workers should have decent health protection? The answer is yes. Do you think workers should have, be able, paid a living wage? Yes, they do. And so you put before them various progressive and democratic uh, liberal policies, and they say yes to them. Then if you ask them, does that make you a liberal? They say, no, I'm opposed to liberals. So that is a sign that there's a cultural allergy there that is not just about the policies, right? Well, it's also there's something wrong with the word, too. I mean, all these words we're using, even on my tongue, are now pejorative, or at least I have to identify with them with some caveats. Liberal is has a a stink on it. So does progressive. I mean, that progressive is now almost interchangeable with social justice warrior. I mean, we need words with which to frame the path forward. And, and, and you use, use one word, which actually hasn't come up much in this conversation, but which you, you invest a lot in in your book, 
which also doesn't really trip off the tongue, and you acknowledge this, and, and that word is citizen, and, and you, you're arguing that we really need a, this concept of being a citizen dusted off and, and brightened and put forward as, as a kind of an organizing principle. Yeah, because, you know, we, it is true that we have a multicultural society. We have a diverse society. People have, think of themselves as belonging to various groups. But there's one thing that we all share, and that's citizenship. And I know that sounds like some school marm standing up at the blackboard and tapping a pointer at, you know, various amendments to the U.S. Constitution. But the idea that we, as citizens, get to determine our future should be very empowering. And there are two sides to citizenship. One is that you have a claim on society. And even more importantly, from my point of view, is that you have a duty to society. We don't have a language of public duty in this country right now, because we have two competing libertarianisms, one on the right and one on the left. And there's no sense that you owe something to your country and that your country owes something to you, that it's reciprocal. Uh, but, you know, it was not so long ago that uh, JFK was able to say, uh, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what for, you can do for your country. And it was an electrifying moment. I was, I'm old enough to remember sort of the, that that was still in the air into the late 60s. Um, but, uh, but we don't feel that now. We don't speak that way. Can you summarize the reasons for that loss of of connection to the notion of duty on the left and the right? Are they the same or are they, are they different sources of skepticism there? Well, I can think of various explanations. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one that uh, I think someone like uh, David Brooks or Ross Douthat might give, and that is that we have delegitimized the notion of duty in every part of our society. It's not just uh, in relation to citizenship, but by becoming a less religious society, by becoming more individualistic, uh, both in our morals and in our economy, uh, that technology has separated us more from each other. We actually have become elementary particles. And so uh, we all yearn for some belonging to something, but we won't accept the idea of duty. And that's been a big change in American society and modern life. It, it's not just happening here. You know, it's happening in any country that's gone through a, a modern transformation. And so that's one explanation. Uh, I think parts of that are true. There are parts of it I wish weren't true, but are true. Uh, but I don't have an answer fully to that question. Um, what I do know is that in the 1950s, uh, people were complaining about young people uh, as being this lost generation that was not political. All they wanted to do was go surfing and get married and, uh, you know, go to go-go bars and things like that. And then Kennedy came along, and then 60s radicals came along, and suddenly there was a sense of common political purpose as citizens. So uh, I have no idea. I, I just, uh, you know, at least I want to put it out there that uh, a lot, you know, we can't accomplish much if we don't set, feel. It's a feeling. It's not a principle. It's not a moral principle. And that may be where we differ, a feeling that we owe things to other, that's, others that's instilled in us at an early age. Yeah, well, I guess I wouldn't separate feeling from principle or 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 reasoning even in quite the same way. I mean, I, you know, I feel something very strongly when I see someone obviously not making sense, right? It's a doubt or a rejection of somebody's claims as obviously untrue feels a certain way to me and I, you know, I, and this is something I've spoken about on previous podcasts, but there's uh, neuroscientific work, some of which I've done, which suggests that this separation between reason and emotion never made any sense and, and doesn't make any neuroanatomical sense. But I think, actually, there, there, there was one explanation. I don't think you discussed it in this context in your book, but this does seem relevant. In your book, you describe how one of the pathologies on the left that is either the cause or consequence of, of movement politics or identity politics is this notion that 
we basically have made no progress at all in the black community or in Black Lives Matter. It's the racial injustice is spoken about as though we are, you know, 15 minutes past Jim Crow. And, uh, and you, can, you can say the same for all these other identities. There's something about this notion that if you're not acknowledging any progress, if you can't say for whatever reason that we have made massive progress on race and gay rights and, and women's empowerment, well, then you're, you're kind of disconnected from reality because obviously we have made significant progress there. But you also, this does seem to cancel this, this sense of duty to one society because you, what you're saying is society has completely failed you, right? You're still in this state of emergency that has never changed and goes all the way back to, you know, slavery or, or women's suffrage or gay men in the closet or whatever it is. And that's disempowering and kind of canceling of this sense of working collaboratively and profitably with society as it is. No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, one, one thought I've had about this is that, um, you know, it, it, it is it has become very, and that's what I mean by the you know, a uh, slightly hysterical tone now and the kind of evangelical fervor that's out there is it seems un, uh, people who are swept up into it seem really unwilling to admit how much progress we've made. We have a black middle class. We did not have that when I was younger. Uh, we almost, you know, uh, probably half the families in America have someone in the extended family who's come out as gay. And uh, there's been acceptance of gay marriage. It's been an extraordinary uh, moment in our, in our history. And rather than using that progress to say that to people, you've made a lot of progress and you need to make more, but we know you can do it because you've made progress. That's an encouraging thing. When you talk to a kid, you don't keep telling him he gets everything wrong. You say, you've actually, you're halfway there and let's keep going. But it's also connected to the fact that, and you know, when it comes to you know student activists, is that, and maybe not just student activists, but the sort of activist Twitter class, that they very much want to say that they've experienced this, and so you know they act as if uh, our campuses were the last bastions of Jim Crow, and they exaggerate uh, the sense of outrage. Um, Van, Van Jones uh, went after this once. I can read you the quote uh, uh, once saying, you know, that you, you're in the most liberal place in America. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to pave the jungle for you. I'm not going to take the weights out of the gym. Uh, you got to toughen up, but you got to get out there. And if these activists said instead that I'm a beneficiary of the progress we've made, I'm not complaining about me, but I am complaining about the fact that there are African Americans who have not benefited from this, that there are places where gays are afraid to come out, and so on. And I'm demo- devoting myself to those others, not to myself, to those others. You would gain respect from other people, right? But if, you know, someone clicks on, clock on Fox News and sees you know, kids at the most elite institutions complaining about Halloween costumes, how are they supposed to take that seriously? They turn off. But if those kids instead said, Thanksgiving break, I'm going out to, uh, you know, a black churches in Baltimore, and I'm going to deliver turkeys, and I'm going to help people in those black neighborhoods, because I'm privileged, and I have a duty to do that, that would be impressive. Yeah, well, we live in interesting times, Mark. Yeah, beware of those. <laughs> so uh, I, I would be remiss in, in uh, if I could let you off here without asking what you think will happen or you hope will happen in the fairly near term here with, with respect to Trump and impeachment and all of that. Uh, do you have a, a sense of where this is going? I, I don't, I, I've spent so much time railing against Trump. Everyone, everyone understands how uh, much I abhor him. So we don't need to talk about how bad he is. But what's your sense of where things are going politically? You know, you and I read all the same things. So uh, there's probably nothing that I can tell you that you haven't already read or 
thought about is possibilities. Um, I mean, in purely crass terms, um, you know, some crass calculating terms, you know, I do worry if we got Mike Pence as a president too soon, that might really help the other side. But that's a superficial thought. No, the, the thing that I'm concerned about, I say, and feel like I want to learn more about is this sticky attachment to Trump. And, uh, you know, that there has been a kind of extraordinary, I'm sure psychologists have a word for this, when you become fully, you fully identify, you cathect with the thing that is causing your problem, right? And so that you uh, have a stake in someone who's dragging down the ship here. And people, you know, I bought a lot of lemon cars in my in my life. And when you have a lemon, you got to know when to cut loose. And these people have bought a lemon, but they will not admit it, that they're invested in a way. There's something deep culturally going on there that needs to be explored and understood. And, and if we could unlock that, I think we could understand the country better. Yeah. Well, also, there's this level of conspiracy thinking in everyone's information diet now, which it's very difficult to correct for, but it's clearly contaminating the way people think about just what is going on in Washington or, or anywhere else. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the excerpt from Kurt Anderson's new book uh, that was published in The Atlantic about how America lost its mind. And he sort of sets it in historical perspective. It might be interesting to have on your show. Yeah, I think, I think but, I'll be but, coming on. But, but going historically, and you realize this is nothing all that new in the country. Is, uh, it's not a very cheerful book, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. More joy on the horizon. Well, listen, Mark, thank you. It's been great to talk to you. And, and uh, it was great to agree and uh, disagree, however subtly. I wish you the best with this book and the rest of your efforts, because you are making the right sounds at this point. Okay. See you on the barricades. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the questions of others. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make this show possible.